As an Ethereum investor, you must be wondering how much longer will Ethereum 2.0 take to finally get released, right? Because this was supposed to take Ethereum to a whole nother level and move us from proof of work over to proof of stake. So in this deep dive video, I'm gonna answer all of your burning questions, give you an update on the latest as of the end of 2020, and also give you a deeper overview as to what you need to know as an ETH or just general crypto investor. So while you're watching this video, if you like what you see, then subscribe down below for future deep dives on our Bitcoin for Beginners channel and check out the pinned comment for a special offer just for you. Timestamps below to skip around if you'd like. And without further ado, let's dive right in. So why make this video right now? Well, because the Ethereum network is currently booming, right? First with ICOs a few years ago and now with DeFi. And transaction fees are high once again. Scalability issues once again brought front and center. So Ethereum 2.0, nicknamed Serenity, is supposed to fix all of this. But that's taking forever to get released, right? The first step was supposed to be in early 2020, now pushed back to late 2020 or even early 2021. But do you know that even when the first stage launches, it won't solve all the problems? It's just laying the groundwork for a more secure and full implementation. So what are the phases of ETH 2.0? How will they be implemented? And what are some recommended solutions in the meantime by our favorite Vitalik Buterin? Let's take a quick look at some of these. But before that, a quick recap if you want. If you've already looked into all this stuff before, feel free to skip ahead. But ETH 2.0 is meant to be an upgrade to the Ethereum blockchain network, right? Mainly to improve scalability, throughput, security, and so forth. And there's two main additions that kind of help with this. Number one is proof of stake or POS. And number two is sharding. I'm not going to dive into the intricacies between proof of work and proof of stake. There's a lot of other videos that do that in depth. But essentially, proof of work uses miners and electricities to secure the network and add new blocks. On the other hand, proof of stake uses validators and deposits. So that means, yes, you and I can both help maintain the Ethereum blockchain network once it moves to proof of stake and earn block rewards in the form of ETH. And you only need 32 ETH to become a validator. So if you haven't gotten that amount, then you might want to work towards that. And all you need to do is to run a client on your laptop, for example, deposit Ethereum into a smart contract, the client on your computer will help with that. And then that's pretty much it. So that's exciting to look forward to. So now they're working hard to make sure that we can migrate our current blockchain over and do so securely and seamlessly, since a lot of money is on the network after all, right? A lot of value is captured in the Ethereum blockchain in the form of tokens and just ETH transfers. So now onto the very first step of ETH 2.0. It's split up into different phases, and this is called phase zero or the beacon chain. And essentially the beacon chain is a separate blockchain that runs alongside our current proof of work Ethereum blockchain. It just is meant to store and manage the registry of validators along with some other information. And it implements the proof of stake consensus mechanism. By running parallel with the existing network, there's not going to be any break in data continuity at all. This is meant to start in early 2020, but now it's been delayed to end of this year or early next year. Any later than that, I'll start to get worried and disappointed. So hopefully, fingers crossed, the developers and the community can pull it off. Next up, phase one is where they integrate something called shard chains. You might have heard of the term sharding as well. Essentially, what they do is to split the new blockchain into 64 chains or shards, and they can process and store transactions and data in parallel. This means that at minimum, it'll have 64 times more throughput than the existing proof of work blockchain. But other tiny tweaks and optimizations will, in effect, get it to be 100x faster. Later on in this phase one, they'll also merge the old ETH blockchain with a new one, and that will be one of 64 shards. So no need to transfer or migrate your coins over. It will live and work seamlessly and all the old history will be there on the new chain as well. This is aiming to go live in 2021 at the earliest but no hard date yet. And after that is phase two. And this is 
the latest stage, less defined currently, but on a high level, this will enable a lot of things to make it go live, like Ether accounts, transactions, transfers, withdrawals, and smart contract execution. In terms of the last one, we're going to be moving from EVM, or Ethereum Virtual Machine, to Ethereum WebAssembly, or EWASM. And essentially, without going too in-depth into what the difference of that is, they are lower level codes for machines and browsers to process. The old EVM was more focused on correctness, while the new EWASM is more focused on speed and efficiency. And this will likely come out in 2022. Now that you know the stages of ETH 2.0, let's talk about some problems in the meantime while we wait for that, right? The DeFi craze has led to more urgency for solutions. So Vitalik Buterin updated the scalability roadmap and included some short and medium term solutions that will work with ETH 1.x being what we're currently operating on, right? So now let's take a look at some of those. In terms of the short and medium term solutions, we're gonna mostly rely on layer two solutions like rollups, plasma, state channels, and so forth. These will not replace shard chains and other things coming in ETH 2.0, so just keep a note of that. Also, some dApps already use these layer two solutions and they help reduce congestion in the network. Let's take a look at how some of them work. But regardless of their differences, they all include processing many transactions on their layers and then only one or two transactions on the main chain to make things more efficient. In terms of rollups, these are executed on side chains and there's multiple transactions bundled together and submitted as a single transaction on the main chain. This is very similar to how Plasma works, except these enable execution of scalable layer two smart contracts. And there's really two types of rollups. One is zero knowledge or ZK and two is optimistic. In terms of optimistic, these are more used for general purpose smart contracts, while ZK or zero knowledge are more used for token transfers and other specialized apps like atomic swaps. Smart contracts are more complicated, so rollups have lower throughput and higher transaction costs. Now there's also state channels, right? And this is very similar to Lightning Network on Bitcoin, if you've ever looked into that before. Instead of one transaction, this approach uses two, one for opening the channel and one for closing it and then you can execute as many transactions as you like while the channel is open, as long as it's within the limits set by the initial transaction. Also, next up, Plasma. And these are more focused on increasing token transaction throughputs and not smart contracts. You can batch and submit these token transactions to the Ethereum main chain, and the Plasma transactions carry a fixed cost. So one transaction in a Plasma block is the same cost as a thousand transactions in a plasma block, right? So as you can see, all of these solutions have different use cases. Not one is necessarily better than the other as a general rule, but it's great to use them while we wait for Ethereum to scale fully. Next, let's take a look at the progress so far towards phase zero or the beacon chain, right? A few test nets have been deployed so far, and these are just safety layers to make sure that things work smoothly before the actual main net is launched. One of them, Madala, was launched in August of 2020, and this was supposed to be the final one before the Beacon Chain launch, but participation was low, and that was around roughly 57%, so finality wasn't reached. Then another one, Spadina, was launched, but it also didn't reach the participation threshold because a lot of validators who signed up didn't bring their clients online. Many people thought that it was because there wasn't enough economic incentives, but turns out that the clients had glitches in their system. So they launched another one called Zinkin Testnet. That was launched and everything worked seamlessly. Within just a few minutes of launch, it reached 75% participation rate. And so that was amazing and it passed. It wasn't as high as their goal of 90%, but it was still the most successful thus far and will let us proceed. So just a few final thoughts. First phase, the beacon chain, is only a few weeks or months away. So it's a step in the right direction, but it isn't meant to fix scalability yet. So in the meantime, these layer two solutions will hold down the fort and more dApps need to use those to improve congestion. In the meantime, competitors are rising like Cosmos, Polkadot, Cardano, etc. So Ethereum needs to stay on track and the devs need to deliver or else if they keep on failing, the other competitors are gonna chip away at their lead. So let's continue to root for Vitalik in the Ethereum community. Let me know if you have any thoughts or questions down below. I'll definitely get back to you. I'm Kevin, I hope you have an amazing rest of your day and I'll catch y'all next time.